Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nine o'clock, and I believe we have everybody online that is going to be online today. I'd like to say uh, thank you for joining me again, and uh, it's a pleasure working with you on these different uh, chapters of insulation coordination. Now, let's just do a sound check here, uh, make sure everybody can hear me. I just need somebody at the other end to say uh, uh, you can hear me and then we'll continue on. Either say it or uh, type it. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you very good. Yes, and and you can hear me too then. Yes. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. Good connection this time, Maria. Okay, then. Uh, let's get started. Uh, this is one of my favorite chapters, and uh, because line studies are always fun, I think that uh, protection of transmission lines is one of the big areas of opportunity for reliability improvement worldwide. And uh, Sometimes a little bit disappointed that there's not more work done in this area of line protection. I'm not sure why it is. I, I think it comes from the fact that uh, when lines, most utilities uh, are very, very good about protecting substations because they have some very high cost assets. And they're good at protecting distribution lines, again, because they have high-cost assets to protect. And on transmission lines, the, there's no assets that are in jeopardy. Those insulators just flash over and then they recover. But uh, the user uh, ends up feeling most of the pain of an of a outage from a line flashover in the momentary. So I think that utilities haven't quite... Um, got on board yet for improving uh, the outage rates on lines because it doesn't cost them as much as other outages do. That's my theory anyway. And uh, so let's, uh, let's move on and talk about insulation coordination of lines. But before that, let's just remember, remember the goals of our webinar here uh, is to understand the methods that were used to determine insulation on systems. Uh, to better understand arrestor functions, to become familiar with modeling lightning studies, and uh, to prove the use of your of your package, whether it's ATP or something else. So for today, we are going to start with uh, very similar to last the last week last meeting. Uh, we'll talk about the different. Let me get my highlighter going here. We'll talk about the different types of data collection and uh, the how it's a little bit different than substations and what's important and what may not be important. And then we're going to talk about these two guys here uh, as targets. You know, what is the backflash rate? And what is the shield flash rate? What are targets, reasonable targets for reliability? Uh, and then we're going to spend a lot of time on... Uh, well, actually, we're going to spend a lot of time probably on this, not only defining it, but then <clears throat> but we're going to talk a lot of, uh, spend a lot of time on actually how do you calculate these two functions or these two uh, reliability targets. Uh, and then we will talk about the models uh, for these different, um, not, I don't want to say targets, but for modeling these different aspects of the, the lightning study. And then we'll talk about critical current and how it factors in here, and we'll run a few scenarios, and uh, we'll do some outage rate calculations. And uh, so it's a full day or a full morning, wherever you are, it might be a full afternoon, and, uh, and we'll go through these. So first, uh, the data we have to collect. The uh, Let's 
see right there. So the the line uh, the the one line drawing uh, for line protection turns out it's not quite as important as the one line for a substation or a generator uh, because it turns out the the pole configuration itself is sort of the one liner and this uh, from the from the pole, I mean, you can get uh, almost all the information you need. You you might need some information to the next to the next tower, but it, it's going to give you the uh, the different phases. And really, there's usually only three or six. Uh, you know, sometimes you can get much more than that. I suppose if you get many circuits, that you could a one liner might be better or more useful. But for simple circuits, a simple three phase or two or two circuits, uh, the one-liner is pretty simple because we usually just look at uh, one one or two or three towers, and they're usually the same, but if they're not the same, you can make them a little bit different. And so the I like to say that the uh, drawing of the, of the tower is sort of my virtual one-line. And you know, if I don't have a drawing, I can also go out to Google Earth and find where the line crosses the highway somewhere, and I can get a pretty good picture of of the tower. And I can literally, I mean, really, I can do a tower study without ever having a bit of information from the manufacturer other than where the line is, and, and then I can go get it. The uh, next item that you want to really collect some information on, or you try to, and then is is ground resistance. And we're going to talk quite a bit about ground resistance later on. Uh, but the, typically, uh, all we can get is the AC resistance. Um, but because we use the impulse resistance of the line for our studies. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, you can, again, we'll talk about this more in detail later, but the a ground rod or any kind of grounding mechanism uh, ionizes the soil. And when it ionizes the soil, it reduces the resistance. And so you can get some fairly, it's a nonlinear function and uh, once you get up to currents that matter, all the resistances are down to a few ohms. Uh, and, and this is really important uh, when we're talking about backflash rates. And what's positive is we only need to do it on a, on a few towers because lightning effect only is a few towers out. And again, we'll talk a lot more about this uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, another critical piece of information of course is the is the system voltage and uh, that's usually pretty obvious uh, you know even that's it's probably good to know the regulation level two so you know what the peak uh, worst case is and the system voltage in line studies is quite important because uh, it does add to the stress across the insulators and we'll see that later on where in the substations, uh, the system voltage was not such a factor. And then ground flash density uh, is another one that's important. Uh, we've seen this, this, I'm sorry everybody, this is the only one I have, it's for the US, there's some worldwide ones, but uh, uh, the ground flash density becomes a very critical factor in line studies. Uh, if, if a line happens to cross, uh, you know, a certain area, um, say it runs just, you know, it runs for, let's see, I need to get my pen. So if a line runs through a, you know, certain area of the country or the air, and it could cross a couple different zones into a higher, lower ground flash densities, you really need to take that into account. Uh, it also, it turns out that if we are trying to mitigate the outage rate on a line, we really don't have to study the entire line. We need to study the area where the problem is. 
and the mitigation could be in just the area where the problem is. Uh, just because it's, uh, it you know runs 100 kilometers, there only might be a few kilometers that are a problem over a, a mountain crest or over a, a, a river where there's a long span or something like that. So uh, we're fortunate that way that it's uh, um, you can mit you can do your studies in small areas and, and and have a big impact, but you always need to know what that ground flash density is for that area. Okay, so uh, now back to collecting data. Uh, this uh, next one is elevation. Well, we learned back in chapter one, I think, or chapter two, how much elevation is. Uh, it's critical. Uh, the flashover of an insulator can be 10, 20, 30, 40 percent lower at higher elevations. So uh, anything that we work on in this, in this kind of study is, uh, is very critical to elevation. Uh, then tower configuration, this sort of comes back to the number one, you know, the uh, it sort of tells you what the one-liner is and, and what the configuration is. It's kind of all in one. It gives you a layout and the distances and, and all that. So that's all kind of together. The other one is the span distance uh, becomes important uh, in calculating the backflash rate, uh, not so much in the shield, shield failure rate, but in the backflash rate. Uh, the um, if arresters are going to be involved, and they're not always, uh, you you should know what the existing arresters are, or what the proposed ratings are going to be. Um, under insulation ratings and and links, uh, that's that's fairly important. Uh, it really is helpful if you can get from before you start the study, uh, you know, what what that insulator characteristics are. Many times uh, I'll find a model number from either the user or somewhere and I'll go to the supplier of the of the insulator and get the actual characteristics. If you can't do that, you can always calculate it and get a really a pretty good estimate from the length. Uh, and so that's uh, that's important. On distribution systems, uh, uh, the shielding factor becomes critical, and we'll talk about that. And that is, if there's buildings that go near the, or trees or hills or different um, different environmental objects that could change the uh, the the collection rate of the system. So all these are are important parameters that we need to go through and. You know, Usually for me, it's uh, I'll have about 90% of it, and I really want to get going in the study, and then I end up going back and fixing it because I, you know, I, I just found out what the uh, environmental shielding was, or uh, found out that span distances are a little bit longer or shorter in some areas. So uh, it's an ongoing thing all the way through a study. Uh, the more you can get up front, the, the easier it'll be to to do it. Okay, so um, there are two reliability measures in line studies. Uh, first one is the backflash rate. And that's, that's really almost the primary one. It's the measure of the number of times a line flashes over to the phase from a direct hit to the shield. So it's uh, uh, one that uh, is kind of becomes a primary concern. And the second one then is what is the shield failure rate? And we'll talk about both of these uh, in a second. And the shield failure rate though then also has kind of a subset. And that is, you know, when you have a shield failure rate, does it actually turn into a flashover? Uh, sometimes if the current is low enough, it doesn't actually become a flashover. And then of course, the, the overall reliability you're trying to get though is, you know, what is the uh, what is the failure rate per hundred kilometers per year? And so, if somebody says they have uh, six outages per year and they would like to get that down to two uh, or one or zero, 
um, then you can run a study to see what can be done. Usually it's the addition of arresters, uh, either over the whole line or just a section of the line, depending on where the trouble is. You know, if this is a flat area across uh, 100 kilometers of plains, uh, it might be really the same everywhere. So I didn't have the mitigation has to be for the whole thing. So those are the two uh, two reliabilities that we're going to be dealing with. And let's see what the next slide tells us. Jonathan, just one question, sure, please. Whenever you 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 find out that the line went went out, you're not sure if you're speaking about the that you have a back flash over or you have a shielding failure. You only know that the, the line went off. But how can you determine whether you are on a back flash failure or a shield failure? I mean, you're not able, I, I'm sure that you're not able to, to determine which one you are. And you only know, I mean, the, the, the amount of failures per year that you have online. But uh, it's critical not to know, to distinguish between those two failures. Uh, good, good question. Um, I was working with a utility one time in the U.S. who had a. Uh, they had a. They had just put a line up. It was 45 miles long, and it was from a generating station. And um, it went through the mountains in Virginia, and there was. Uh, they knew they had they knew they had a shield failure rate and the way they knew it was that it was a strike it was a strike to a lower phase so i i think uh, and they had done studies that they knew that if there was a backflash on the line it was going to be in the top phase but i think sometimes there is a possibility of knowing uh, by which phase is hit um, whether it's a backflash or a shield failure. Uh, but I, I think probably more often, I think maybe more often than not, it's, uh, you're right, it's, you can't really tell uh, what, uh, whether it's a shield or a backflash. I don't know. Uh, as I think about it here, I'm not sure it will affect any any of the of this. Yeah, it would affect the study because if you if you thought you were always had backflashes and you were end up having shield failure rates, then you could do a lot of work to improve the backflash rate by putting arresters up. Oh yeah, it would still affect it. So if you put arresters up to improve the backflash rate and then you had a shield failure rate, the arresters would still mitigate. A shield failure rate. So, <clears throat> do you think uh, uh, at the end of the day uh, it matters? Well, do you know the, the difference? I mean, um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I have only have only data about the line when when it went off, but uh, I'm not sure due to these total failure rates. I mean, if you sum the sum the the two rates. Yeah, I mean, is it critical to to determine whether it was a backflash over or a shield fail? I mean, with the data that I know right now, I, I'm not sure if I can distinguish between these two, and if I need to to determine with whether it was backflash over or a shield failure. So, when you tell that it, if you are sure that it is a backflash over. The, the the way to mitigate it is to use or to determine a new arrestor or to put some extra arrestors or or whatever. But when it is a, a shield failure, uh, you 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 should go through the way to 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 change the uh, the insulation or or some other. You should go in another way to solve the problem. I mean, I if you are able to distinguish whether it was backflash over or shield failure, I think that the that the mitigation is going to be the same for both. 
if uh, I mean, typically, uh, if it's backlash, the first thing the utility wants to do is improve the grounds. And, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and then the second, but and if the if the if it was a shield failure, I don't know if there's anything you can do other than uh, unless you wanted to put a different shield wire up or change the shield angle or add a second shield wire or something like that or raise the shield wire. I can't imagine uh, it would be very very mo much more costly than applying arresters. So I think the solution to either one is going to be really the same. So then, it, then so, it, it wouldn't matter whether what it was or not, whether you knew or not. So, so for the shield failure, you you should increase the height between the the ground wire and the to the to the faces. That's one one way to solve it. Yes. Uh, another one is is to 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 improve the resistance of the ground footing. That's not going to change your back your shield failure rate. Oh, it's it's not going going to improve it. Uh, that would only affect the backflash rate, not the shield failure. Okay. So the shield failure, it, it's only going to be mitigated by increasing the height. Uh, or move or, or, or adding uh, or multiple ground wires. Yes, or or moving or moving the ground wire. Uh, you might move the ground wire out farther to the right or the left to give it a, a, a better shield angle, but it may not, uh, uh, it's still going to be much, much more cost effective, I think, to use arresters to mitigate it. Okay. Okay. That's, that's great. Thanks. Good, good question. Thank you. Okay. okay so, I, and I think another answer to your question, uh, Odin, is uh, you'll see in a second how there's such a radical difference between the shield failure rate and the and the backflash rate that the backflash that that maybe the shield failure rate is so low it's going to be kind of rare to even have it. So going to the next slide, then this is an example of what shield failure is, and shield failure is by definition when the when the surge uh, hits directly onto the phase and goes right past goes right past the shield wires and it's usually a fairly low current surge we know from our studies that it's low current you'll see in a little bit why in a few minutes why uh, so it, by definition now we're looking now for any kind of surge that will come down and hit the line and uh, and completely avoid the shields that turned out the, the study in uh, West or in Virginia was uh, that there's a there's another factor a pretty important factor in the shield and that is how flat is the ground below the shields if if the if the if the uh, tower is on a, a real steep hillside or if the wires go by a steep hillside that the, the shield effectiveness is can be different from the right to left side of the tower, and it's that's uh, discussed in, in Highland. I don't think I even discuss it in here, but it, okay, so it is back. that's an environmental shielding, I guess, or whether it improves it or, or make it make it worse. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Say again. It's what? I mean, the uh, when you're speaking about the. the on one side of the yeah. of the H frame, you, yeah. whether you have a mountain or something yeah. that improves your shielding, that's an environmental shielding. I mean. Right. So on one side you get an improvement, on the other side it gets worse. Okay, that's right. Yeah. So we can get a so if the hillside is coming down like this, the shield on the left of this one here gets improved, and the shield on the right gets gets worse, and it's easier for the the lightning to get down around uh, on the lower side. So here's uh, going to some of the principles here on, on shield failure rates and how we get to it. Uh, every every conductor, no matter whether it's a shield or whether it's a phase conductor, it has a, a collection zone. 
Uh, and this collection zone is, is uh, circular along the length of the line. And in this case here, I'm only drawing the I'm drawing the shield uh, collection zone for the two shield wires. And, and now if you take the two, all three conductor wires, uh, I only have two covered here, but so now these, if there was no shield, then any, any surge uh, of a certain current amplitude, uh, if it got into the zone, it would hit, it would hit down to the ground level, it would hit the phase conductor. If the shield wasn't here, even the center conductor, for instance, if it was uh, the strike came down in this area, it could hit the center conductor and not hit these two out here. Oh, I guess not. According to this, it would be, I, I don't know where it would go. It could go to either one. But now if you put these all together, oops, if you put these together, um, you'll see that the, the collection zone for the shield wires is up here and and then the collection zone for the phase conductors is right in here until you get to the ground level then it hits the ground so there's there's two or three places for the the lightning to come to if if the lightning comes down anywhere from in this this zone here from left to the right it will hit it'll hit the shield wire it'll end up on the shield wire if it comes down in this zone uh, it runs into the zone of the conductors and it'll hit it'll hit the conductors so you can see that the the reason you can have a shield failure is because uh, you avoid essentially the surge comes down and it runs into the collection uh, zone of the conductor and and and, the, and it's outside the collection zone of the shield and uh, we end up with a with a, a shield failure. Well, this collection zone turns out to be a function of current. Uh, so. Uh, what happens is that for, and also I should say that the ground, uh, the earth itself is a is a collector. Once you get so far away from the tower, then the strike is going to hit the ground no matter what. And so all three of these, uh, all three of these strike uh, collection zones are are variable. They they vary based on the current amplitude. So as the current amplitude goes up and down, the zones change. Let's see if I have uh, what my next one is. Uh, so as the current stroke increases, the conductor strike zone uh, will decrease. So as the current increases, the, the collection zone for the shield wire goes up and the collection zone for the phase conductor goes up and the collection zone for the ground inc goes up. So all three of these uh, change as the current amplitude increases or decreases. And at some point this, so you can see at, at higher currents here that uh, any stroke that's in the green area, any stroke in the green area will land on the shield wire any stroke in that's coming straight down and I know it's nothing comes straight down but we have to put the we have to assume a, a straight a roughly straight stroke um, otherwise we, we can't even begin to uh, approach or analyze this but if it comes down and it hits this small zone in this case here it will end up on the phase conductor and and then and so on if it comes down here it ends up on the ground so we can increase the current amplitude to a certain level where now there is no um, there is no collection zone visible to the lightning. The shield wire and the earth zones overcome the the shield the phase conductor zone, and now lightning uh, will only either hit the earth or hit the phase 
or hit the shield wire. This point is called IMAX. And this is where this little section of this collection zone, if I go back one slide, when this, this is called D sub C, uh, it's the gap or the collection zone of the phase conductor. When it is zero, you are at the point of IMAX and uh, you won't have a shield failure. Can't have a shield failure for that current amplitude and higher. So fortunately, where shield failures only occur for lower current amplitudes, say 15 K, Ka or a little bit higher. Let's move on. So it is possible to calculate this shield failure rate, and uh, it have you use course the ground flash density you use the length of the line and then you use the integral of this little zone here this collection zone for the phase conductor from 3ka up to i max or where d sub c is equal to zero so it's a it's this integral plus the length plus the ground uh, number of times it could get hit and then a factor of two. I don't remember why the factor of two is there, but oh, it's two sides in this case. So uh, it's a daunting formula for some, but uh, Heilman makes it easy and he simplifies it. And in chapter seven, uh, he shows where you can just use the height h sub c of the conductor, height of the conductor the height of the shield wire, the ground flash density, which really tells you how many times it can get challenged in a, in a year or in over 100, over some area. And then A, what's the dimension A? Dimension A is the distance from the phase conductor, distance between the shield conductor and the uh, and the phase conductor. So those four variables, and you can come up with a shield failure rate. Now the shield failure rate isn't the end of the story because there are uh, current levels, uh, say below, depending on the insulation level on the line, you might be able to uh, take a stroke to the sh right to the phase conductor of say 5,000 amp stroke or a six or 8,000 amp stroke and still not cause a flashover. And the flashover is what really matters to me. So you could have a shield failure at very low currents and not have a flashover. And uh, we're going to run into this one again, this critical current level. This is the I sub C is the current that will cause current that will cause a flashover uh, around the insulators on the phase. And I sub C is a function of the CFO, or the length of the insulators, and the impedance of the line. So instead of integrating it from 3Ka as we did in the last slide, Go back here. This is integral of 3Ka to I max, or and then if I max is 15, that would be integral of 3 to 15. For the ones that actually cause a flashover, you don't need to go down to 3Ka. You go down to the critical current level because there's no reason counting if it doesn't flash it over. So the the shield flashover failure rate. So SFFOR. What is the flashover rate when you have a shield failure now becomes a little bit smaller. Okay, this is a typical uh, number that's used for a, a decently shielded line as 0.05, um, an outage rate of 0.05 outages per 100 kilometers per year if you don't have this number. And Jonathan, the, the I sub C is usually 
uh, determined by the by the ATP. Uh, you, yes, yes. So, so you you have the CFO on the search impedance for the phase conductor, and you're trying to to determine when the the current starts flowing through the resistor. So you determine the critical current. Uh, that's it. I mean, that's the way to determine using ATP. Uh, in H, you know, we're going to talk about that in the next section in detail. Okay. Um, okay. Right. So I sub C becomes a very critical number both for uh, shield failure rates and for backflash rates. And okay. we'll talk about how to calculate. It's really far more complicated sometimes than I wish it was, but we'll talk about it. Um, okay. Also in uh, Heilman's book, he has numerous uh, uh, equations that help you predict it. And this is his, this is a simplified equation to protect I sub C. And and you could take almost any any line out there. It doesn't matter what it is. Any line out there, and you can get a rough idea of I sub C based on this formula right here. Uh, at least tell you you're going to be. Uh, Within you know thirty forty percent of I sub C. Jonathan. Yes. Um, I sub C is the current on the conductor of the conductor. It's not the current of the lighting. No, no, it's the current of the lightning. Uh, oh, okay, of the lightning. Of okay. the lightning, right? So it is the it is the if you. Well, I, should, I have to be careful here. It's the it's the current of uh, it's the. Lightning stroke current that causes a flashover on the line. So when the lightning hits the line, uh, whether uh, if it hits a shield wire, for instance, that might go on a couple different directions. Uh, and you don't really have all the current down the tower, but it's the stroke of it's the lightning stroke current, I sub C. So when it hits the Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm I'm confusing things here. I sub C in this case is the actual stroke current onto that phase. So I sub C for a shield failure rate is a little bit different than I sub C of the of a backflash of a rate. My, my pardon me, I'm mixing things up here. So Odin, back to your question, your point is that this one you don't calculate in ATP. Uh, because it's much more simpler here. I sub C and a backflash of a rate is more complicated. I sub C for a shield fail rate is as simple as this. It has to do with the insulation level, the impedance of the line, uh, times two. So you, you don't use it, and you don't get it by using ITP. That's only the, the strike, the, the stroke current. This is only the stroke current. And okay. It, it's a stroke of it's a current that comes right down that channel and hits that line. And, okay. And when we do a backflash of a rate, we also have an I sub C, not to be confused with this I sub C. We'll talk about that in a second. So okay, okay. I get it. I kind of wish that in uh, our insulation coordination guides we would have I sub C shield failure and I sub C backflash failure, but it's, it's uh, so this one here is strictly the current coming down the, the stroke. All right, to the next slide. Uh, I don't know if this works. I don't know if I played this video for you before or not. Um, hopefully this comes out okay. On a shielded system, when the overhead ground wire intercepts a lightning stroke, it conducts the current to ground via its down bend. If the tower ground resistance is too high, the voltage at the base of the phase insulator will increase. If the voltage increases enough, it can exceed the withstand level of the insulator and cause a backflash from the tower to the phase conductor. When the stroke is over in about 100 microseconds, the ionized air along the insulator remains. This ionized air provides a perfect path 
for the normal AC voltage to then flash over from the phase to Earth. This second flashover is the issue. From the second flashover, power system current... Hang on a second here. Are you guys hearing audio on this? By the breaker back to the substation. This breaker operation then causes the moment... I hear they're low, very low, but I can hear. If the overhead ground wire is struck and a transmission line arrestor is installed, this scenario is much different. Should the voltage at the base of the insulator rise as it did in the last case, instead of a flashover of the insulator, the arrestor clamps the voltage across the insulator to levels below its flashover. During this clamping action, the lightning current flows backwards through the arrestor onto the phase conductor. The lightning current is only a few thousand amps in amplitude and is easily handled at the station by the station arrestor mounted there. The strike is over, the arrestor turns off, and the system is restored without a fault. Or a breaker operation. No blink on the system, no potential damage to the insulators. I, I don't think that worked out very well. Um, let's see how to get this off. All right, so where did, were you able to heal the audio on that at all? Okay. Um, need some feedback here on whether that came through or not. My audio just went out. Okay. So, uh, Odin, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Did you hear the audio on that? Yeah, pretty poorly, but, but, but I can hear again. I, uh, okay. We have the dot .mp4 on Dropbox, I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, it's in it's in the folder. It's in the chapter four folder. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I saw it. Uh, I mean, a few oh, weeks ago. Gotcha. All right, so uh, when you're, so backflash rate is, uh, you know, it's all about how often does, was the insulator's backflash because of the voltage at the base of the arrestor is higher than the voltage in the phase. And if, uh, and this is a, a this is a critical uh, um, parameter on line studies is what is the backflash rate. So uh, if you don't have the backlash rate of a line or uh, if you're trying to get a, uh, you know, a sanity check on, on, your, on your, hang on just a second, I have some, an interruption here in the office. <laughs> there. Okay. All right, uh, if you have, uh, if, if, you, if your goal is to measure the backlash rate uh, or determine the backlash rate of a line, you can use this graph here as a, uh, you know, as a guide. Uh, these are typical numbers that you might get. Uh, you can see that the lower the system voltage, uh, um, the, you know, the higher these backflash rates can get. So it's, uh, uh, we usually do studies uh, for trying to improve backflash. It's usually on the lower voltage systems, not on the very high 500 kV systems. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't, but it's, usually on a lower voltage system. So calculating this backflash rate, uh, this is just an example here of what the voltages can be. Uh, if the voltage on the, if the voltage on the shield wire is a megavolt here in this case, uh, and that's uh, 900 kV on the base of the top phase insulator and 800 kV on, and then 650 or so. Uh, you can see that if the CFO of 
the line and just real basic terms here. If your CFO is, uh, you know, less than 900 kV, then it's a pretty good chance you're going to have a backlash on, on this insulator because of the voltage at the base. The formula for this then is uh, NL, which is the, the length of the line, uh, times the probability of I sub C. And in this case here, uh, I sub C is again the stroke current. And um, it's the current that, it, even though it's still the stroke current, it's going to be a different current level than uh, than the I sub C for the shield failure rate. Because in this case here, the, uh, the stroke current oftentimes has multiple paths. If you're doing a system study and you hit the shield wire, immediately you have current in, in both directions. One, uh, if you hit near the one tower, you're going to have current flowing to, to two or three or four towers. Uh, so it the actual current that flows down through the tower in question is going to be lower than I sub C, of course, and it also is going to have a different wave shape. So uh, I sub C and the backflash calculation, even though they're both stroke currents, is going to be uh, could be lower or higher than the I sub C in the shield failure rate calculations. So you can see the only factors here in the well. In the simplified form, the only factors here are what's the, how many times is, is the line going to get challenged in L times the possibility or the probability of having a, a current stroke, a current amplitude of, of any level. It gets much more complicated than that because the first thing you run into are, are the many different uh, considerations that have to take into account. You know, where where does the stroke hit? Does it hit a mid-span? What's the footing resistance for the tower that you're on and what and the tower next to it? At what voltage did you hit? Uh, remember, remember the surge current is all of uh, a few microseconds in duration, and the phase voltage is, you know, 16 milliseconds or 15. Uh, 16 or 20 milliseconds in you know in uh, duration for a cycle. Um, what is the you know how is the downground on the tower? How is it connected? How wide is the the zone the collection rate in our and for distribution lines? What uh, what are some of the uh, environmental effects? And then it uh, turns out that. Another statistical variable in this whole thing is the time to crest of the of the stroke, and then the, another statistical variable. Uh, no, it's not statistical, but it is uh, nonlinear. Is uh, what is the flashover uh, levels of the insulator, and it also depends on stroke current. So it gets it gets uh, kind of complicated when you're doing this. And this is why ATT is one of the favorite tools for determining this, although ATP isn't the only way. Um, IEEE Flash uh, is a very simple non-ATP program that is used to, to calculate backflash rate quite accurately. And, uh, and there's other ones that, um, like the Sigma SLP is one, I think, it's, and it's it uses a fairly complicated uh, form of ATP. Um, and so there's all kinds of ways of doing it. However, we're talking about ATP for today. Let's go over each one of these variables that uh, can change the, the calculation of the backflash rate. First one is what happens if it hits right at the tower, or if it hits mid-span, or if it hits, uh, you know, half a quarter of the way out. Uh, 
there's been a lot of work in this area, and uh, we know for certain that uh, it will the the voltages uh, on a mid span are going to the stresses on the insulators are going to be different than they are uh, if you hit right at the tower. And so uh, according to here, according to Heilman and, and other people have studied it, uh, there's less stress on the insulators when you have a strike to mid span. So they've come up with an average of 0.6. So this is uh, kind of a compromise. Um, that's used. Of course, in, in ATP, uh, we, we only really, you, can, you, you only can calculate it at one or two places. You can't calculate it everywhere. So we, we also use this. Once we find out the critical current in ATP, then we use a variation of this formula then to arrive at the backflash rate. Most. Jonathan, where is I sub C on the, on the graph? I sub C is only is directly the, the, the strong core, the yep. strike core. Yep. In this case here, I sub C is the strike current to the shield wire. Okay, and then the yeah, that that I sub C it's being split it into the, the two arrestors. Uh in this case here, I sub C is gonna go this way, it's gonna go this way, and it's gonna go down the tower. So there's gonna be three routes for I sub C in this case. Three levels. It's still the it's the um, I sub C is still the current in the stroke current, but then it'll travel in three different directions once it hits the shield wire, or two directions on the shield wire, and then the first pole down the down the down ground. Okay. Okay. So that's great. So we'll be looking in, in ATP, and here in a few minutes we'll be looking for I sub C that causes a flashover of the insulators. Uh, we'll be looking for a current that causes the flashover of the insulators, and that becomes I sub C for this equation, for this, uh, for this exercise. And that I sub C that causes the, the critical flashover is the one that you use in the, in the shielding failure rate to calculate the shielding failure rate? No, it's not. Nope. The I sub C and the shielded failure rate is calculated strictly by that formula that I showed you before. It basically okay, let's move on. I guess it will become clear as, as we move on. I'm sorry, say again? I, I mean, it, it will become clear as we move on using and calculating I sub C, I guess. Yes, well, if, if it doesn't, we'll, we'll go over it again, yes. Okay. Okay, the other, another variable that uh, is becomes important is what is the, the the ground resistance of the tower. And as I said in the introduction, under under collecting information, uh, we collect the AC resistance, and the AC resistance uh, is just what AC or DC. It's a low current resistance that where where the current comes uh, where you put current into the ground. And then you measure this resistance of this earth over to some probe. Well, when lightning strikes, we have uh, we have ionization in the earth around here, and and it lowers it lowers the resistance of the of the earth uh, considerably there, as a function of current. So in this graph here in the center, you can see that the uh, if you have a measured resistance of, say, 25, 25 ohms, uh, that's, you know, at very low currents. Once you're up to 10 ohms or 10 amps, it's already down to less than 20 ohms. Once you get up to 1,000 amps, the ionization in the soil has taken over and you're down to just a couple of ohms. And... This becomes significant because the backlash rate then of, of your tower uh, could be extremely high. It would, it would get very high numbers if you didn't use this nonlinear resistance. Uh, if you thought that your resistance was 60 ohms, uh, that would put some pretty high stresses on the 
faces of the insulators. So we we use a nonlinear resistance for our studies that uh, usually ends up make, improving the backflash rate or giving us what you, it would be considered a, an improved backflash rate. If you want to if you want to run through this, these are the these are the formula for determining what the ground what the impulse resistance is based on the AC or the DC resistance that's measured, and it's in this formula that's also in the that produced this curve and it produces this this table, uh, and one of the variables in besides the resistance the resistance of the AC resistance is what's the uh, what's the ground resistivity. So I know in the U.S. you can get the ground resistivity pretty much anywhere from the on the internet. I'm not so sure. I'm sure you must be able to get it worldwide. I bet you if you go to this uh, USGS website, they probably have links to the worldwide ground resistance, or ground, uh, not ground resistance, ground resistivity in ohmmeters. So I, I won't go through the, I won't go through the calculator, but it's there in the, web, it's in the folder, and we'll be using uh, these equations in our model for the ground resistance. I also do have a model there that allows you to take a look at um, a, a pole. Let's see if I can expand this a little bit. Uh, allows you to uh, just take a lightning surge and uh, hit a tower, one tower, one single tower to keep it simple. And I use a nonlinear ground. I use a linear ground. Uh, and I also use line impedance and just inductance for the tower. Uh, so I, one of the variables is uh, in the tower. Oh, it's not really a variable, but there's two, a couple different ways of modeling it. As uh, you can model the tower as an impedance or as an inductance. So this is a this whole model that I have here kind of gives you a feel for uh, not only what how the resistances can affect your model, but how the how you model the tower can also affect your model. So I used the 350 ohm impedance for the tower, and then for the inductance I used the standard 3.3 uh, uh, microhenries per foot which is what we use for any conductor, whether it's a small or very large conductor, 3.3 microhenries per foot. I think the next slide shows the results of this little study. And so for a, a nonlinear ground, you can see that the this is the voltage, uh, this is the ground potential rise. This is the voltage at the ground itself. Uh, let's go back one. So I'm measuring the voltage right at this point right here. You can see we have for this uh, a thousand amp surge, um, we generate about 30 kV through a linear ground. Um, whether it's a, a line impedance or an inductance. But through the nonlinear ground, we only generate uh, some 5 kV ground potential rise. So it, by using a nonlinear ground, it reduces the effect of the ground potential rise um, on the whole study, which I believe in my, uh, you know, really does make it more realistic. I suggest that you uh, run run this model and play with it a little bit, um, kind of a sanity check. If you're going to do a, if you're going to do a, if you're going to do a tower study, um, you should always check your sensitivity, one of the sensitivities of the ground resistance. 
uh, oftentimes uh, you're doing a study and um, and you want to know what the maximum ground resistance might be that you can handle that would still give you a decent flash over rate. Yeah, so this is this is one of the things that you would be working with. Okay, the next uh, variable that becomes really important here is the what point on the voltage, on the phase voltage, do you actually strike? And we talked about this uh, chapter two ago, uh, and I showed that in a substation, because we're looking at the voltage on the, the most important voltage would be the voltage from line to ground on the transformer, and there's transformers are usually pretty solidly grounded. There's there's very little, uh, we don't have long down grounds or impedances in the tower uh, to deal with, or in the in the substation to deal with, but out in the, you know, a 200 foot tower, uh, you know, or a 40 or 50 meter tower, they become very important. So the AC voltage across the AC voltage on the phase um, now becomes more critical. So what we're really looking at here, instead of looking at the voltage from from one side of the insulator to to ground, we just look at the voltage just across the insulator. In this case, the insulator is, is modeled as a capacitor, and we have a voltage-sensitive switch for the flash over characteristics in parallel with it. And I have an MOV arrestor that's been pulled out of the circuit here. It's, it's an open circuit. So the next slide will show, it's kind of a summary slide here that uh, kind of gives you a feel for how the phase voltage will affect everything. And on the top phase, uh, this is the voltage uh, to earth from the high side of the insulator to from the high side insulator. Yes, it's from the phase side insulator to earth. And you can see that the maximum voltage is on this blue phase because of the impulse uh, polarity, perhaps. And we have a maximum of 750 kV. This is for uh, a minus 70 kA stroke and a CFO of 1.2 megavolts. So we're not even close to the CFO of the, of the insulator. Now, uh, at the same current, if we look at the voltage stress right across the insulator, we see that the highest stress comes on the red phase, um, which is the top phase. And we see uh, like an 800 kV-ish. Um, 800 kV versus uh, 750 or so on the negative side on the on the bottom phase. So you really need to know where your surge is. Well, I should say it that way. You know, you can never determine when the surge is going to hit. Um, and this is why people use Monte Carlo methods of for inline studies, the what they'll do is they'll look at a thousand strokes at all the different angles on your line, and uh, use that to predict the probability of a flashover. However, you can pretty much assume that uh, in a thousand hits, you're going to have the same number of hits at uh, crest voltage as you are at zero volts and as you are at negative crest. There's no reason to believe why it wouldn't be that it's random and it, it's going to be uh, pretty much the same for every point in the phase. So the, what IEEE flash does and what a lot of people do, what I usually do, is I always look for the crest. Um, I always calculate it at the worst case scenario, which is, would be when you have a surge in the opposite direction of, uh, of the AC voltage. So when you had a peak voltage 
peak AC voltage here and a, a negative surge, you get the highest stress. So instead of running a Monte Carlo, you can actually run a deterministic type, at least uh, so sort of deterministic, um, and just measure it at at, uh, at the crest voltage. Uh, and so that's part of the equation, just using the crest voltage. So that was uh, uh, just an example of why the, the voltage or how you can look at the effect of the voltage. The next, the next variable then is the configuration of the, of the line. Uh, how tall is the line? How wide is the line? And where does the line exist? And this is what I call, and I think I don't know too many other people call it, but it's the collection rate. Uh, and N, NS here is the um, is the ground flash density. Uh, pardon me, NG is the ground flash density, and NS and NS now would be the number of flashes to the to the line. So if, if, this is really a 3D. It's a 3D thing, uh, and then you have the height as one of the dimensions in the and the width between the shield wires is another direction. So this is a pretty simple equation. And uh, I have a calculator here, again, that's in, in the sub, or it's in the folder. And uh, maybe I'll bring it up right now. OK, where is it coming up? There we go. So. This is a um, this is a, a calculator that we're going to use for a couple different things here, uh, but the very first thing it does is it it uh, one of the things that it'll do is uh, for any size for any height or amplitude of of uh, Tower, it'll give you the collection rate based on its structure and the ground flash density. So in this case here, I have a, on line six here, I have a, a height of 40 meters, uh, and it's only a meter wide, uh, so it's probably a vertical configuration. But it's in an area where we have 14 strikes per square kilometer. That means that the this line over 100 kilometers is going to collect 359 surges in the 359 strokes in in a year per 100 kilometers, or per kilometer 3.5 strokes every kilometer on this line. So this collection rate, uh, this collection rate then becomes uh, an important uh, important part of determining the backslash. Rate of any line. Also in this calculator here is I have the the uh, little sub calculation that shows you for uh, any once you have determined what a critical current is, and we'll get to it later. Uh, you can now determine what the probability of that critical current is. So, and that's based on this. It's based on this set of formula here. And we'll get back to that in a second. So back to the presentation. This calculator is in the is in the folder. Next slide. So for distribution systems, uh, also we have. Uh, the need for checking the effect of the environment on, on the system. So if, and, and this is pretty common. So if you have, uh, again, this, I'm showing a, a transmission system here, but the environmental effect is really only affected by, or it's only really a factor for maybe 69 kV, maybe 115 kV. Uh, so if you have a right away in a forest, um, 
that runs through the trees, then where the towers are something around the same height as the trees, then we have this distance D and the height H, and uh, you can calculate the effect of, uh, of the environmental effect on the forest, or uh, on the, on the uh, strike, on the collection rate. So it has, uh, the more forest you have and the closer the forest gets, the lower the strike rate gets. It's also back in the calculator, uh, this whole section, oops, back up. Let me bring up this calculator. So I, I say in this calculator here is for distribution only, but it could be for lower voltage. It could be for lower voltage uh, transmission lines too. And uh, this determines what the, the environmental effect is going to be on your line. So once you know what the collection rate is, you can see what the effect will be uh, from nearby nearby forest. Okay, back to presentation. I think there's one more. There's a couple more things here. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, regarding the insulator itself. Uh, as we studied early on in Chapter 1, uh, insulation has a nonlinear characteristic that it's a function of the time to crest of the voltage stress across it. So if you put a very fast rising surge across an insulator, it will withstand that um, uh, at a higher level than it would the power frequency. Uh, voltage across the insulator, or even a switching surge across the insulator. And this curve that we have right here is, is shows that shows that nonlinear characteristic. So this. This nonlinear characteristic then is is modeled can be modeled in their most uh, ATP type software, uh, and this is called the uh, geometric uh, geometric. It's a geometric model, and in um, in ATP or an ATP draw, we have built in a uh, mod flash, which is a voltage sensitive switch, and it's driven by the voltage on the switch, then is driven by a small sub program. And you can, uh, I'm pretty sure it's available in all, all it comes with uh, built into it. And you can, you can adjust the variables in, uh, in the, ver in the formula to change, to change this curve and you know some insulators might have a little bit different curve uh, it might be based on the geometry of the, of the insulator uh, so you can adjust that if you want but uh, usually it's uh, uh, what it's built in is works quite well and so if, if you end up with a very fast um, a very fast rising surge then the insulator is going to flash over at a higher voltage. Uh, if it's a very slow, slower rising surge, like the first stroke in lightning is uh, five or six microseconds to crest, but the second and third strokes can be uh, one or less microseconds to crest. So it might flash over uh, at a higher voltage on the second stroke and a lower, lower voltage on the, on the first strokes. In in ATP, um, when you're using flash, all, all you really need to do is uh, enter enter this value right here um, for what the flash over is going to be, and and it will produce then uh, uh, it'll it'll flash over at higher than the given CFO. So you put in the CFO, and it'll depending on how fast the surge is, it'll it'll uh, flash over at higher levels. 
think uh, illness is a tower model here. go back I would I would recommend that uh, what you do is you take a very simple model like this to get familiar with this and with this uh, function and impulse uh, you can you don't need to use a whole system you can just use just a small model and uh, an impulse and impulse at different rate arises and uh, and you'll see that the actual flashover changes uh, as a function of the rate arise Okay, another um, variable uh, is it as a tower model, and using the same model that I had for the ground resistance, you can put in uh, different impedances for towers, or or you can use an inductance. Um, uh, and uh, again, though, I mean the resistance, the ground resistance is the biggest factor. And it turns out that the tower impedance is pretty small. Depending on the study you're running, <clears throat> it might be important. Um, uh, and I have in the AT parameter spreadsheet, I put in a tower impedance uh, calculator that allows you to determine what the tower impedance is. So uh, you can then, you know, put it in for the set between the phases and phase to ground. So it's another variable, but it's a very, very small one. Uh, tower example model. Uh, we could open the model, but I think we better move on. Uh, it, you can go in and do your own uh, your own study, and using this this model that I have in the folder, and uh, determine you know which which model you want to use for your impedance, whether you use just pure inductance or you use a, uh, a 350 ohm impedance or 100 ohm impedance or so on. Okay, what I didn't cover today, and I'm going to cover it again next week, is uh, the variable of time to the, the backflash rate is a function of not just let's go back a few to the oops, go back to the formula right here. So the simple in the simplest form the backflash rate is the critical current times the probability of of that critical current times the collection rate. So it's really also the probability of time to crest, because the probability of time to crest becomes almost as important as the probability of the of the amplitude of the current. So there's two probabilities, and we're going to cover that in chapter five, uh, because I want to I wanted to get through the simpler form, and then we'll add the complexity of the time to crest in the next chapter. So back to now. Let's find. Let's run ATP. I'll show you how I would do it. Uh, there we go. So your your assignment is to determine the flash of a rate of a line. And in order to determine the flash of a rate of a line, you first thing you need to do is, deter, is to determine what stroke current, I sub C, hitting the tower will cause any one of my flash, any one of my insulators on the pole, the closest pole, or the next pole or tower away, or the next tower away from that. And uh, what you'll find is that, uh, you know, if you have different tower resistances, radically different between two towers, perhaps, uh, if you have uh, different insulation levels between the two towers, if one tower has arrestors on it and the other tower doesn't, uh, you're going to get different critical currents that will cause the system to flash over. So it's, it's not just the critical 
current, and this is a critical current, to the shield wire, not to the phase conductor. So the, what current level, what lightning current level hitting my shield wire will cause my system to flash over anywhere? That's why you have to model, uh, the, you know, certainly model two or three towers or four or five towers in each direction. If depending on how many different types of towers you might have, or how, how much the ground resistance changes, or if you had some old insulators and new insulators, and so on, so you have to build a model. Uh, in this case here, I have uh, these three towers in that direction, and and three spans in that direction, but I, I'm only studying this one here at the at this moment, and I have. Uh, a 1400 kV CFO insulator, and I have a 288 kV MCOV arrestor that's not connected, and then I have a stroke to the shield wire, and this is what this tower happens to look like. It's a, a, a monopole tower with insulators that actually hold the conductors at the very end. It's a really simple tower. Uh, there's uh, you know, the conductors are at the end. And in in this tower model, of course, you put um, all the parameters, get all the parameters of this, uh, of essentially put the parameters of the tower in the, uh, the LCC span, um, and it tells you how far away the lines are, how far they are above the ground, uh, how many are there, you know, where the location of the shield wires and so on. And you, you run this model at different current levels until you find a flashover on the insulator. So uh, what I always do is I, you know, start low and I impulse the arrestor at higher and higher currents. Um, I, no, I don't impulse the arrestor. I impulse the shield wire with higher and higher currents. Remember, we don't, we're not looking for a, a voltage on the shield. Um, if you're thinking, if you think back to the substation, you, we put a voltage on the front end of the substation that's coming down the line. We don't really care what kind of currents behind it. We just care that there's a voltage surge coming into the substation. One well, no, in a tower study here, we, of course, we care about the voltages, but the driving force is the stroke current. So we have to use uh, stroke current as, uh, as our, our, ins our, um, our activator of the whole thing. And then we measure the voltages on the shield, the voltage at the, at the base of uh, each insulator. And so, and then at the, at the base of the tower. In this case here, the base of uh, insulators B and C is the same because they're both on the same same level. And and if you don't see something like this up and down your tower, you probably don't have the model working quite right. I mean, there's always going to be some uh, lower levels of, levels of voltage as you're going to down the tower, and there is going to be some ground potential rise. Uh, so that's kind of a sanity check of what's happening. Well, now you can also, I mean, it's important to do a sanity check on your, on your insulator model too, because this becomes such a critical piece of the, of the, of the work. And you can impulse it, the current, current <coughs> part of me. <coughs> My apologies. That's something in my throat. Um, do a sanity check on the, the rate of rise of your surge and the effect that it has on the insulator. Because if you're not using a, uh, 
the right model for your insulator, uh, you might be able to get the wrong results. Here's a, a five, a four microsecond rise time, and it flashes over at two megavolts. At a five second rise time, it flashes over about 1.5 megavolts. Uh, here's six microseconds to rise, and then 10 microseconds to rise. So this tells us that yes, the uh, it has a higher withstand, um, a higher withstand for the shorter rising surges. We could plot that out and should look very similar to what the, the insulator withstand curve should look like. Again, just a sanity check. So now if you want to find the uh, critical current, uh, you adjust the, the amplitude of the surge, and you hit you hit the shield wire, and you watch the effect on the on the insulator. This is what you're going to see for uh, a 50 kA surge. There's no flashover, and I'm looking at the this is the voltage that's hitting this is a current or this is actually the the stroke current that's hitting the shield it's at 50,000 amps that's right here 50,000 amps and then the voltage on phase a is um, say minus uh, 100 kV and the voltage on the peak voltage on the top phase is about 1.2 megavolts. This is with no flashover. So now if we raise this current up to 100 kA, we see on the top phase, we're monitoring the voltage across the insulator, the voltage drops to zero. Uh, the voltage across the the bottom two phases, the middle phases, they have some funny stuff happening on them, but it's not, there's no flashover because it doesn't drop directly to zero. And of course, this is just a current through the <clears throat> current that's hitting the shield wire. This is I sub C. This is the stroke current hitting the shield wire. So what we just determined here that I sub C uh, is going to be less, or it's going to be more than 50 kA and less than 100k. At least this is the method that I use. So now I, uh, you know, go back and forth a few times, and I find out that at what current here, right around, um, I know the stroke current is not 50 because it fills it right over here. This is not true. Uh, we have about 90, 90 ka we have a flashover. So the voltage across phase A, um, it drops at 90 kA, which means I have a flashover. And now that is my critical current, I believe. Yes. So now the I sub C for this tower is 90,000 amps. Now, if I looked at the current going down this tower, I would see it's not 90,000 amps because some of that current went to the towers on either side. Uh, so it doesn't matter what the actual current down the tower is. It's what is the stroke current that caused the flashover. And uh, so I sub C in this case is the... Uh, well, and again, I'm I was using I'm using uh, only one rate of rise. We'll talk about that later. I'm only using one rate of rise. I have a rate of rise of my stroke current of, of about three microseconds or so. Um, <clears throat> but we'll we will we'll talk more about that next in the next chapter. So with this rate of rise, uh, my and the CFO of my insulators, um, my critical current is 90 kA. 
usually in the study where we are uh, asking ourselves, okay, what will the effect of an arrestor be if if we put an arrestor on the system? How does it improve the, the flashover? It's, so in the model, we just add in we add in the arrestor. I don't remember the rating of the arrestor here. I selected one, but I'm, oh, there it is. It's 288. So I I put in 288 kV MCOV arrestor on this uh, 1400 kV CFO insulator, and I impulse it again, and I find out that let's see in the next slide. I find out that now at 90 kA I have no flashovers. There's nothing drops to zero. The phase A voltage has some aberrations on it, uh, but nothing drops to zero until I get to 178 kA. In 178 kA, the, the top phase is still not flashed over because that's where I put the arrestor, but now the one of the bottom two phases uh, is flashed over. So now we increased the critical current of this system from 90 kA to 178 kA. Wow, just by the addition of an arrestor. Is it possible to have a 170 kA uh, strut current? I mean, it seems to be too high, but uh, I don't know whether it's possible or not. Uh, it is possible. And, uh, it is possible. It is possible, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, however, the probability is very low. And uh, so, you know, depending on where you are in the world, uh, putting this one arrestor on the top phase may be all that you ever need to do, and you would take your outage rate to zero. But that depends on a few other variables that we'll talk about. Okay. It's okay. So when running a, this is the, essentially, this is the, uh, you know, that's my, that's the scheme for determining I sub C. Let me go back here. Is that you, uh, you build a model. You essentially build the whole tower. You put in uh, the right ground resistances. You put in the right towers. You model the insulator. Model the insulators. You don't have arrestors in, of course, until you want to test that one. Uh, you have a, a span, a certain span distance in both directions. Uh, you build that in, and and then essentially run different scenarios at different current levels, at different current levels to find out where you get a flashover, and then you put your if you're mitigating it for a rut with arresters, you put your arrestor in and you run it again. You run the different current levels and you find out that you can go to, usually go to a higher current. I mean, if we had done, in this case, if we had done, uh, put an arrestor on the bottom phase, I didn't do it in this one, but if we had put an arrestor on just the bottom phase, it probably wouldn't have raised it up as much. Uh, because it was a top, top phase is getting most of the, the voltage. Yes. Uh, can you go back to the, the previous slide when you have that, that when you when you have a, a 14 kb CFO, that's that's the critical flashover of the insulator. But the same insulator that you have on on zero meters and at the sea level, and you have a the same insulator at one at fifteen hundred meters. Uh, sh should I decrease the critical flash over that I place on the mod flash value that you used to inf? I guess it was the the, the label. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, 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 when I was doing my, my let's say homework for the ch chapter three. I have the, I, I was doing the same analysis uh, on my uh, on my installations right now, and I'm above uh, a thousand meters. So I decrease the insulator values over twelve percent. So when you you should place the 
the critical infrastructure of all the insulators, the the bill level of the of the bushings of the transformer is not being decreased, but the the critical infrastructure of the insulators I have to reduce it by twelve percent, I guess, according to to to, to the height. The, uh, that, that's the same case in here for the for the for, 14 kb line for yeah. the 14 kb critical flash over that would be should be according to the height of the installation that's correct okay so the altitude uh is decreases the critical flash over there but it also decreases the vil of the bushing on the transformer of the transformer bushing only it doesn't pushing only okay yeah right. that, that's right but not, not not the windings correct okay that that's 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 okay thanks yeah as a matter of fact in the last study i did my checker was quick to correct me on that because i had uh changed the because of altitude i had changed the bil of the windings and i should not have in my final table so <clears throat> it, it's easy to sometimes get confused, uh, did not change the outcome of the study any, but uh, our margin of protections were a little bit better when I did not reduce the winding BIL. Now remember, though, so anything that sees the uh, change in the atmosphere uh, has to have that correction factor for altitude, anything. Uh, no, that's, that's great. Uh, and it's both BIL and CFO, both, because they both are telling you what the flash over voltage of of the, your configuration is okay thanks okay so some of the things you need to watch out for is uh, uh check for flashovers and other phases um and also keep your power frequency, uh, make sure that you're at the, that the maximum, that peak voltage of the opposite polarity of the current stroke. Uh, and if you, or either you can use a Monte Carlo method and there's different ways of use, doing Monte Carlos and ATP and other things, other methods. Uh, I always test at least three or four towers in each direction. Um, Beyond that, you you I mean you can, but you'll find out that the usually nothing happens that far out. Uh, even even in a third tower away, it's rare to have anything happen in either direction. So fourth tower catches it all. Uh, I I use a nonlinear ground. I think when I'm out in the on a tower, I use nonlinear ground because that's what happens in a substation. I always use a linear ground, uh, and it's always low. I'm not dealing with 10s and 20s and 30 ohms. I'm dealing with 0 0.5, 0 0.6, you know, 1 ohm kind of grounds. Uh, and this really is a rehash of the first one. Use the phase voltage that's opposite. So I, if you put an arrestor on uh, all phases on, on this tower, uh, oh, I did. I did do a study here. So if I put an arrestor on the just on the top, no arrestor on this system gave me 90 k. Uh, if I put it just in the top phase, it gave me 178 k. If I put it, um, this is, doesn't seem right. It seems like this might be a different one or something because the top and middle phase I got 198, and if I put it on all three phases. I got 2,500,000 amps, 2,500 kA, so which we know is not a possible possible. So it, it but ATP doesn't realize that. I really have to question whether I have a top and middle because the middle should be. Oh, I know. I put it just on one side. So if I put it on just one side, then uh, uh, to ground, it doesn't it doesn't protect both sides, even though it's there at the same location. 
So I put two arresters on, got me 188 KA, and then if I put three arresters on, it gave me 2,500 miles. I always refer to that as infinite CFO when we have that. Okay, back to um, getting from I sub C to your back flash rate. Uh, this is a this one has actually avoided me for a little while uh, before I actually developed this this little tool, and uh, because once you know what the I sub C is or the critical current for the backflash, you still have to turn that into a, a, a what you know really is an outage outage rate, and that's and that takes in some of the other variables. So we we defined it our we defined all our components. We created the model. We impulsed it at different levels until we found what that current stroke current was that would cause a flashover. And now we have to get a flashover rate. And let's go to the calculator. Oh, it came up on the wrong screen. There we go. All right, so you should see the calculator up on the screen. Um, we have a, if we just assume in this case here, we had a 40 meter tower, maybe we should go back and use the real numbers. Uh, if we assumed 100, uh, 100 critical current of 100 k in this case here, it goes the calculator goes in and it it looks at this uh, probability curve and it says the probability of 100 k a stroke is uh, for the first stroke is about uh, five percent. Um, let's but for the second stroke it's uh, it's a little bit lower. Sorry for the confusion here, but I'm going to see if I can't do this one more time here. Odin, oh, you had asked a minute ago, what's the probability of a 178KA? 178. Let's find it up. 1%. So 1%. One, 1 in 100. One in a hundred strokes at any location on Earth will have a one percent probability of of hundred k. That's per one hundred kilometers. No, that's um, one percent of the times. I mean, or, 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 that's the unit consider the, the kilometers of line that you have. Here's a newer version of this. Uh, if the stroke rise time is 0.5 per, uh, if it's 0.5 microseconds, let's do a, a regular, more common stroke. Um, if the stroke rise time is four microseconds, and we had 178. Okay. Uh, it's still one percent. Uh, I think it's probably uh, 1.05 percent. So. This says that out of every 100 strokes anywhere on Earth, the probability of it being four microseconds to crest in 170K is 1%. Okay. And so when you're, doing, or when you're doing a study and you determine that the probability of, uh, or not the probability, you determine that I sub C is... Let's see, we determined that it was 90 Ka, right? Let's go to 90. 90 Ka, that says that there's a 5.89% probability of, of seeing a 90 Ka stroke. It, and again, this doesn't matter where you are on Earth. It's just any out of any stroke coming at you, uh, almost 6% will be 90 Ka. Well, that's good, but... Um, let's, you still need to put in the factors of the, of the height of the tower. So if the height of the tower is 
40 meters and it's a meter wide. Oh, let's use the real numbers. Uh, it was Oh, it was. So if the higher tower is 40 meters and um, so 40 meters and one meter wide and then there, and if it was in a ground flash density area of, of 14, flash. 14 uh, and and it has again it's independent of the probability of the current level, it's going to see 3.5, 3.6 .6, um, strokes every every kilometer on that line, or 359 every 100 kilometers. So now you have two factors. You know what your collection rate is, and you know the probability of the of any particular stroke. So if we move down, the next, let me calculate the next level down, um, let's ignore that distribution for a second and let's go on down to the real. Let's say this is in, in an open line. Um, so for a 10 kilometer line, Bring up the calculator and just do it the real way. Then. There, can you see that? So for our line, we had 100, we had 90 k. We 90 k. We have a uh, ground plate density of 14. Uh, enter the length of line is say 100 kilometers. And that says it's going to be 359, um, 359 strokes per year. But now the line flashover rate uh, is a combination of the collection rate and the current level. So you multiply the ground flash, you multiply the collection rate times the probability. And now we have 21 per year for 100 kilometers, or or a time between of 0.05 years. So it's going to be quite a few quite a few hits uh, for this particular line if it has a, a 90 ka um, critical current. But now that's 100 kilometers. Now let's go down to a 10 kilometer line. So. Uh, on a 10 kilometer line, it's going to have 0.4 flashovers, or time between flashovers is a half year, so it's going to have two per year. So, I mean, the the length of the line has a big factor here. Uh, if your your line is only one kilometer long, then uh, that means uh, you know every five years you're going to have a flashover. So, to get from to get from uh, I sub C to a flashover. Uh, depends a lot on the length uh, of the line. Let's go back to this 10 kilometer line. And we have two, two, well, maybe, what's a more reasonable length? Uh, that's only 10 miles. Say it runs, uh, let's go 100, let's go 100 kilometers. Um, so it is a real long line, um, 100 kilometers. And it's going to have 21 outages, 21 flashovers per year, which is a lot. So let's put that one arrestor on top and we'll raise the uh, critical current up to 178. Let's see what happens. There we go. Now we reduced our outage rate down to four per year on that line by putting one arrestor on, on the top face. And if we raise, if we raise it to, uh, if we put it on all phases, it went to 2,700. Better be zero. 24. Yeah, that's almost. Yeah, 2400. So uh, that's why I say uh, arresters, uh, you, a, a line will become lightning proof if the if you put arresters in all phases. So the, the whole process then is you find your, let's go back to our calculator, to our presentation. And 
And so now your backflash rate uh, and your your shield failure flash rate, you add those together and that gives you your total outage rate. And there you name it differently, the, the stroke current. You, you name it I sub O or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, so I sub O for the critical current on the shield is I sub O and the critical current on the back flash is I sub C. Yes. I agree. Yeah. So that that's that's the whole that's the whole scheme. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more next week or the next session about the. There's another statistical variable called, and that's that probability of the stroke current, the the rise time of the current, and that okay. becomes another another probability. Uh, but that's the that's the whole scheme of things. So. For lines with, uh, again, uh, final comments here then, for lines that are uh, a CFO of greater than 350 kV, you're, there is no induced failure rate. We haven't even talked about induced failure rate, but that uh, there is no induced rail failure rate. Uh, hill sites can affect that switching flashover failure rate, not switching, shield failure flashover rate. And uh, if you have Heilman, I, would, I really suggest that you, you read it cover to cover. Um, I have lots of options here on, on homework for you. Um, if, if you run into any problems with them, uh, send me an email. We can talk about them between now and the next, our next session. Uh, I have the next session scheduled uh, for the 13th of July. I think it was someone, was it you, Odin, that said you couldn't make it? I'm on holiday from the 13th, but... I'll catch it up. Or I'll, I'll try to to connect even if I'm more holidays. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, I'm uh, I'm also going to record it, so uh, you can you can listen to it, um, and we're going to we'll finish it up with uh, uh, some distribution studies, and we're going to talk about backflash and some underground underground circuits. Oh, it's okay. I've been on late, so I'll, I'll catch it up, or I'll, I'll try to connect. Okay, any any questions? Any other questions for today? No, it's what's great. Uh, I have some much more come with than I expected to, but it seems to be working for me. Okay, very good. Uh, it's been a pleasure, everyone, and uh, I hope you have a nice weekend, and uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Many thanks. Sir. All right, take care. Okay, bye. Bye now.